Hey, good morning, everyone. Sarah Spivey here today on Science with Sarah. We are at the STEM Academy at Nimitz Middle School with some awesome sixth graders who want to say good morning, San Antonio. And today we're going to turn this tea bag into a mini rocket. Hope you'll stick around for that. Live from Case at 12. Good morning, San Antonio starts right now. Hi, good morning. It is Wednesday, September 28th. We can't wait to check back with Sarah and the sixth graders at Nimitz Middle School a little later on. Let's talk weather. It's a main topic of conversation this morning for a couple of reasons. As we go outside with live cam, it's calm and cool here. But of course, all eyes on Ian, which is jaw dropping in its size and power this morning. Justin, it is. It's going to be a very bad situation for Florida, unfortunately, here over the next couple of hours. We do expect landfall will occur occur probably a little bit later today, maybe around midday into the afternoon. And we're going to have much more on that coming up. First, though, let's start with the lows here this morning here in San Antonio. It was a gorgeous morning, 60 degrees to start, 50 in Bernie Stage, 51 Kerrville, 53 in Hondo, 53 Pleasanton, clear skies, and it really made for a beautiful, beautiful morning. Here's the case at 12 hour forecast. A lot of sun today. It's going to look very similar to yesterday. 86 noontime. We make it up to around 90 this afternoon. So it's a pretty rapid warm up from our cool morning lows. 83 by 7 o'clock, 81 by 8 p.m. And just light winds today. There's the latest as we look at Ian. And boy, that is a uh, that is a big storm. You can see the eye and it's getting a little bit closer to the west coast of Florida near Fort Myers. There tornado watches in effect for much of Florida and the latest on this hurricane. Winds are at 155 miles per hour. This is a strong category four storm gusting to 190 and again landfall expected later today. More on the storm surge, how much rain, how much flooding can be expected across Florida. All that coming up in just a bit. Very much, Justin. Well, some San Antonians are lending a hand to combat the punch that Ian is expected to deliver to the people of Florida. About three dozen employees from CPS Energy left for Jacksonville this morning. They will help the people of that city undo some of the expected damage from that storm. Trina Weber was at the East Side Service Center as they left and tells us they're expecting to tackle a tough job. These crew members tell me they are ready and willing to help. They say they've been preparing for this for the last couple of days. Those three dozen or so crew members are going to help many more people feel a bit more comfortable. They took time to get a few words of wisdom from their supervisors. The workers gathered for a briefing before heading out on the road. The plan is for them to drive caravan style to Mississippi today, then complete the journey to Jacksonville by tomorrow afternoon. That city is expecting major power outages from the storm. Jacksonville's electric company requested the help from CPS Energy. The crew members will do jobs such as repairing down power lines and replacing utility poles in order to restore electricity to homes and businesses there. No one is sure exactly how long these crews will be there in Florida. They say it could be up to three weeks, but it depends on exactly how much damage Hurricane Ian causes. Reporting from the east side, Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. And time now is 9 Let's go ahead and check in with our Stephen Cavazos. Well, the commutes uh, dwindle down now, Mark and Steph. So we got a look around town. There is 35 at Martin. Uh, Transcribe really not showing a whole lot out there. Just some pavement. Few folks still making their way to their destination, but that's good because uh, basically they're not going to encounter major problems out there. But I do want you to be on the lookout because although we're not seeing it on Transguide, we do have a crash right here off Loop 1604 westbound near Redland Road, not too far from 281. Uh, here's the thing about this side of town. This, the, this area right here, 1604, does not have any Transguide cameras, so we're not able to show you the conditions out there, but it's an area that we are already seeing a little bit of a buildup that was stretching in these west lanes of 1604, but it does look like uh, we're going to have to keep an eye on that throughout the morning. Let's take a drive now a little bit further south over here at 410 eastbound at San Pedro Avenue. The crash still being reported by text dot, uh, but 410 east is usually a busy spot, so we'll see a slowdown there as well. Not done yet, guys. We have one more over here, this time on the west side of San Antonio, 410 northbound or near the west side, I should say, uh, right there northbound at Marbach Road. A uh, third crash reported, but it's really not causing major issues in the area. Wide look at the map now at 902. You can see that again, the commute has dwindled down now, but we still have these crashes that we're going to have to watch throughout the morning. And we'll give you those updates, but hopefully before the show wraps, there'll be a better one again uh, by the end of this newscast. Guys, thank you, Stephen. Here's today's 9 at 9. 
All of Cuba has been left without power after Hurricane Ian hammered the country's power grid. Ian rapidly strengthened overnight as it heads for Florida. Forecasts show it could make landfall as a Category 5 storm later today. Residents have been warned to get out now as thousands of customers have already lost power hours before the storm hits. The House Select Committee investigating the January 6th attack has postponed today's hearing due to Hurricane Ian. The hearing was set to reveal new information that has been uncovered since the last hearing on July 21st. A rescheduled date is expected to be announced soon. The death penalty trial for Parkland High School shooter Nicholas Cruz has been paused ahead of Hurricane Ian. The trial is set to resume on Monday. Jurors are deciding whether to sentence Cruz to death or life in prison without the possibility of parole for the 2018 mass shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. The Senate approved a stopgap bill that would keep the government funded through December 16th, averting a government shutdown. The vote had earlier been put in jeopardy due to pushback from both sides of the aisle, but Democratic Senator Joe Manchin agreed to drop his reform proposal and Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer agreed paving the way for the vote to succeed. Next, the Senate will hold a final passage vote, but it's not clear when. A new bipartisan bill would make it harder to overturn a certified presidential election, and the bill is on track to become law. The new bill solidifies that a vice president cannot throw out the results. Certain lawmakers help certify. It also prevents swapping out electoral college members. Lawmakers are unlikely to hold votes until after the fall elections. Attorney General Merrick Garland says the federal government has seized enough fentanyl to kill 36 million Americans, and now he's asking parents for help. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid that's 50 times stronger than heroin and 100 times stronger than morphine. Garland says families should have open and honest conversations about the deadly consequences of fentanyl. The NAACP is requesting a civil rights investigation into the Jackson, Mississippi water crisis, saying the state has long discriminated against the majority black capital. Civil rights organizations submitted a complaint to the Environmental Protection Agency requesting an investigation into the use of federal funds related to drinking water and alleging that those funds have been diverted elsewhere. The CDC has updated its mask recommendations for healthcare employees. They say employees can lose the mask if they are working in areas where COVID-19 transmission is not high. As of yesterday, more than 68% of U.S. counties have high levels. But the CDC says it made the changes based on the current information on COVID-19 in the country. Falling gas prices through much of September, helping boost our confidence in the economy. The Conference Board's Index of Consumer Confidence is rising for the second month in a row. The Commerce Department also says sales of new homes rose in August by nearly 29% compared to the month before. And that's today's Nine at Nine. And the latest now in Uvalde, a day-long protest there is no closer to ending today. Four months after the Robb Elementary School shooting, parents of victims say they are done. Asking for accountability from the school district, they are now demanding it. Lee Waldman shows us how some parents refuse to stop until action is taken. It has been 18 weeks. Our children are dead and you still have these cops rolling around here. Families are fed up with the waiting. Now they're demanding the Uvalde CISD school district open an investigation and suspend the officers who were at Robb Elementary on May 24th. Do your job and suspend these officers pending an investigation and then we can go from there. Brett and Nikki Cross were joined by other grieving parents and supporters blocking the district central office, preventing Superintendent Harrell and other staff from entering before the family spoke with them. 77 minutes, so just as long as you guys, we've been an inconvenience to you, that's how long our kids were there. Eventually, DPS officers escorted Harold and other employees inside, and the Crosses say they also escorted them out around 11.30 a.m. Hi, this is Lee Waldman with KSAT. We're outside of the admin building, wondering if we could speak with anybody. Um, just a moment. Hi, Anne-Marie, this is Lee Waldman with KSAT. This is the third time I've called you today. It's just before four o'clock this Tuesday. Later, district maintenance put up these signs. All I know is they were dropped off to us and we were told to put them up. 
Angelita Rodriguez and her daughter Dahlia drove these pink slips from San Antonio to stand with parents as they protested. Would y'all want to give it to first? Uh, I, I would have to give it to the other parents since their kids' names are in there. For me personally, it'd be how I else. Brett has no plans to leave, not even to sleep. Other parents are staying by his side. I am not leaving this spot until they suspend them. Lee Waldman, KSAT 12 News. Now, the Valley City Council also met yesterday. They voted to cancel the special election for former school district police chief Pete Adadondo's council seat because Eloisa Medina is running unopposed for that seat in District 3. Right now it's 908 and 69 degrees. September ends Friday, but it doesn't. The need for food does not stop. After the break, we're going to check in with our Max Massey out at the RBFCU location off of I-10 near UTSA Boulevard as we continue our Hunger Action Month food drive. And checking back in with Sarah Spivey and David Sears out at Nimitz Middle School this morning for a new edition of Science with Sarah. They are ready to go. Their experiment also coming up in just a few minutes. We are at the end of September, but there's still time to help someone in need. This week is your last chance to take part in our KSA community food donation at any participating Randolph Brooks Federal Credit Union location. The San Antonio Food Bank and RBFCU have partnered up to collect non-perishables for Hunger Action Month this morning. Mr. Max Massey is out at I-10 and UTSA Boulevard. And Max, how have the donations gone so far? Guys, collectively throughout the month of September, the donations have gone really well. I want to show you the bin that we're looking at here at this location. Take a look. We've seen a lot of the RBFCU bins throughout many locations. This one, not as full as others. Don't worry, though. There is still time. Come on out. Donate. Join here with Michael from the Food Bank. So, Michael, in terms of donations through Hunger Action Month, how's it look so far? You know, donations are trending well, honestly. Um, but the tough part is just keeping up with demand. Um, and so I would say they look better than prior years. Um, but our need right now is something we haven't seen. Um, really, uh, the pandemic was one thing, but now need is up so high. You know, inflation, all the cost of utilities, all the kind of things around us have just created an incredible swell. So uh, the donations are needed more than ever. Now, obviously, we see the need for non-perishable items. We have the 12 most wanted items right here, but people can also donate monetarily. Yeah, for some people, um, you know, if they're not swinging by one of these great branches, making that secure donation online is really, really easy. You've got a QR code people can also use. But $1 provides seven meals, and it's just because of the efficiency of the, of the food bank working with great um, food donors as well. Now, obviously, September some is Hunger Action Month. You can make a donation of food, make money, but you also have kind of this uh, Hunger Action Month bag that you, you pulled out of the car, so you're ready. Yeah, literally, like, so um, as a part of this incredible month of September and building awareness and giving people just tools to take action, we have a theme of hope is in action. And we just, we talk a lot about fighting hunger, feeding hope. Um, but we wanted to give people an opportunity just to, you know, uh, it's that experience. You're driving in your car, you pull up to a corner, and there might be somebody that just is, is looking for some help, right? And probably most people are reluctant to give the dollar. Um, and so these hope is an action bag. It's something you can pull out from behind your seat. This one has Gatorade, uh, granola bars, snacks, uh, fruit snacks. It's got a mask in it. Um, but just that opportunity to um, pass on kindness and generosity and uh, to build up hope in our community. Now, not only our community, we know the hurricane in Florida. Are you guys preparing to step up, help out over there? You're part of the Feeding America Network, 200 food banks in the United States and um, a dozen in Florida. So we're already in communication with our Florida partners, praying for them, of course, but the network is already aligning resources and preparing. So just have folks stay tuned. We're really looking to see um, where the immediate need is going to be and then what they're going to need after that. All right, Michael, thank you so much. If you guys have any questions about donations here, Hunger Action Month in and around San Antonio, and then Florida preparations, we're going to have all that information on KSAT.com. Guys, back to you. All right, thank you, Max. We have a few more days. Hi, right, Justin's back now talking about local weather and Hurricane Ian. And, and Justin, I noticed in the last hour or so, it looks like some of the storm surge estimates jumped by a foot or two in some areas, depending on where you're at in Florida. You're right. They just updated those, and we just got the new update from the Hurricane Center. Ian is a few hours away, I think, from making landfall. So we can see this here on the radar and satellite picture. This is a big storm, and it is a massive, strong storm. The eye wall very well defined there as it approaches the west coast of Florida. And then uh, we have bands coming out across much of the state producing, in some cases, some tornadoes. So there's a lot of threats here when you're talking about this hurricane. Let's give you the latest stats. Winds are at 
155 miles per hour, gusting to 190. This is a strong Category 4 storm. It's moving north-northeast at about 10 miles per hour. And as we look closer here and we put it forward in time, it's around 1 p.m. where this thing may finally make landfall as a Cat 4 storm, winds still at 155 miles per hour. But what we're showing here is the wind field. So hurricane force winds extend basically from Tampa down to about Fort Myers, and that's where there could be some significant damage when it comes to the wind. Now, there are other factors here as far as storm surge and rainfall, and I'll get to that in just a second. But this works its way inland. Category 1 storm by 1 a.m. tomorrow, so it's weakening over land but still causing some issues here. Works its way up through the Orlando area as a tropical storm, then eventually turns and moves up to parts of Georgia and South Carolina as we head into Saturday. And in fact, some of the college football games there in South Carolina and North Carolina have been moved because of this, because of the heavy rain potential associated with Hurricane Ian as it moves north. Uh, let's talk about winds here. So it is at 155. That is top end of Category 4. You start talking about Category 5 when winds are at 157 miles per hour or stronger, but regardless of whether it's a Cat 4 or Cat 5, this is a very, very dangerous storm. And the storm surge is going to be a huge issue, as Mark pointed out. They raised the numbers a little bit. So uh, you're talking about Fort, Miles, Fort Myers, to just north of Naples here, 12 to 18 foot storm surge. And keep in mind, a lot of this land is not very high. I mean, a lot of it's near sea level. So you get that storm surge, it's going to cover many houses there along the coast. And that is a, a big, big issue. Not only that, we have to think about the freshwater flooding too when you get all this rainfall, up to 15 inches of rain as Ian moves across parts of Florida. So a lot of hazards. This is likely going to be a big story here over the next couple of days. Of course, we'll have more on it and uh, ABC will also have more on it through the day. As we go outside for you here locally, what a great morning. 69 degrees right now at the airport, 71 Stinson. 70 Kelly, 69 at Randolph. We started off at 60 this morning, so we're already starting to see temperatures warm pretty rapidly with that dry air in place. There's a look at the lows. 60 here in town, 60 in New Braunfels, 51 Kerrville, 58 was the low in Gonzales this morning. In fact, most of us were in the 50s, with the exception of San Antonio, Castroville, and New Braunfels, but we were right on the edge there. As we look at the uh, big swing in temperatures today, and this is what dry air does for us, we start off cool and then end up pretty warm. 90 this afternoon is the forecast high. So this is going to look pretty similar to yesterday. 30 degree swing in temperatures from the high to the low. But the mornings and evenings feel really nice. And the dew points are really the big reason here. We've got very low dew points. We're in the dry category. And it stays that way. Really through the foreseeable future, we've got low dew points. We get another push of dry air on Friday. That lowers the dew points over the weekend. It's not until next week that we start to see a little bit of a bump in moisture, maybe Monday, Tuesday, but even then it's not going to be huge. So the forecast site today, 90 here in town, a lot of places in the 90s. If you're in the hill country, you can expect some upper 80s today with uh, clear skies. And the extended forecast, we're going to go 91 Thursday, 89 Friday, 89 Saturday. You know, the only change to this forecast is to add a little bit of cloud cover Sunday and Monday. And these are just some high clouds. These are not clouds that will produce rain for us. So it stays dry, but the mornings are going to be fantastic through uh, even into early next week, guys. And of course, Ian will be the uh, big story going forward here. And as uh, Ian makes it a little bit closer to the coast, we'll continue to have some updates for you. All right, we'll watch out for it. Thank you, Justin. Yep. Right now, 919, 70 degrees. All right, let's take a live look out there with Sarah and David. She's going to show us the class pet. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, okay, she's trying to feed it. There you go. Wow, ah. <laughs> We're going to find out the pet's name, I guess, when we come back after the break. 923, it's Wednesday. That means it's time for another Science with Sarah experiment on the road. This morning, Sarah Spivey and her trusty assistant, David Sears, are out at the STEM Academy at Nimitz Middle School on the north side. Good morning, guys. So what kind of experiment are you doing today, and what the heck was that in the the tank of water there. <laughs> oh my gosh, I know, that was an axolotl. His name is Newton. 
fitting name for a science class mascot. An axolotl is a type of salamander, and he was eating some bloodworms from my hands. It was cool. Today, David and I are conducting a science experiment with wonderful sixth graders here where we're turning tea bags into lanterns, rockets. So here's what you're going to need. You're going to need a tea bag, all right? But this needs to be those old school kind of tea bags with the string and a tea bag that does, is not sealed at the bottom, that's made out of paper. You're also, like that, you're also going to need scissors. What you're going to do is you're going to cut a straight line across uh, the uh, tea bag there and actually empty the contents of the tea out in a pie pin. Now we have a pie pin here uh, so that because we're going to be lighting it on fire we don't want to catch the table on fire or have anything going on there. Then what you're going to do with the tea bag is you're going to turn it into a cylinder and set it straight upright just like that David. Keep on going right in the middle there bud. <laughs> I'm going to help you Set out, okay? And then, so, you also need a lighter. See, that's, now, because, that's the hard part of the experiment. Now, because we are using... Uh, well, somebody didn't cut it straight across. I'm not who saying who. <laughs> because we're using fire... you got to cut it straight across. Yeah, because we're using fire, yeah. please make sure to have adult supervision. Then what you're going to do is you're going to light the top of the tea bag on fire and watch what happens. Whoa! Okay, it creates a current inside the ash becomes light and it floats up in the air. And something I like to do is try to catch the ash before it heads back to the ground, just to A, see how far it goes, which was pretty far from the table, and, and you don't want ash everywhere. But look how light this is, okay? It's incredibly light. So that's all you need. Tea bag, pie pin, try to catch the ash, lighter. And now, our wonderful sixth graders here at the STEM Academy at Nimitz Middle School have been waiting a long time to get this science experiment going. Are you guys ready to do this? Yeah! That's awesome. Okay, well, coming up after the break, these sixth graders are con going to conduct the science experiment themselves. Hey, you could try to do it along with us at home if you want. We'll be back right after this. everyone, welcome back. We're at Science with Sarah at STEM Academy at Nimitz Middle School. We're about to make some tea bag rockets with some awesome sixth graders. So let's get started. If you wanted to, you guys, if you wanted to light your top of your tea bag on fire there. Here, push this one down here. Like Look that. at it. There's our first there one. There we go. Three, two, one. It's almost awesome. gone. And here comes the ash. Okay. Wow, all right, Whoa. next, go ahead, dog get, dog get set up. We're gonna go as fast as we can So the here. way that this happens, the reason this happens is because it creates a convection current inside of the cylinder Whoa. and the hot air rises, okay, causes the light ash to rise. Now, these sixth graders here have been studying about wildfires. It's okay, it'll still, even if it falls over, it's all right, you got it in a pie pen. So let's try this one again. It so that's a great fall. example of how if it doesn't stay upright, it may not it may not go up in the air because it has to have that column of hot air. Uh, these awesome sixth graders have been studying natural disasters. There goes one. And this is a way that wildfires spread um, pretty rapidly. They create their own currents and that can cause additional fires to start. So when you do this, you want to make sure you light the top. Oh my goodness, there's the ash. You want to make sure you light the top of the tea bag, not the side or the bottom. And if it tips over, it may not, it may not go up in the air all the way. Okay, you ready? Oh, let me help you here. I'm going to hold this, and then you can light it at the top. Let's, let's see what happens. Nice. There it goes. Nice. There it goes. Stay up. Stay up, right? There it goes. Woo! What did you just say? It smells like marshmallows. It smells like, like marshmallows. marshmallows. That's right. So now, what did we just create? We just created fire. Actually, let's try this. Well, one like here. that movie. So again, if you want to try this at home, all you need is a tea bag, some tin foil, some scissors, and you should be able to do it at home. Look at there. Look at that. So once again, what are we uh, what are we creating here? We're creating convective currents inside Go of ahead. the tea bag. Good. Oh, convective currents. 
fine. So we're con we're creating convective currents inside of the tea bag. Inside so of the tea bag. So you have bag. a great example of one that needs to be recut across the yeah, top. Yeah, you were watching there. me. Because it needs to have a flat surface at the bottom. All right. That should right. work there. Yeah, go, go for ahead. it, guys. I'll go ahead. Fire away, so to speak. Uh oh. God. Yeah, I know there's a the air conditioner's on. <laughs> you know, it's hot. So, what do you guys think? You think this is fun? Convection current. Look at there. Nice. Oh, it's all right. Look at, look at it's okay all because if you have multiple man. tea bags, you can do it again. With far, okay, go and ahead. you can actually see how, even though all right, all it wasn't in its cylinder, it's still creating its own convective Three, currents and two, causing it to fly one. around. Let her rip. Look at y'all. Look at that. Beautiful. Oh, they're doing awesome. That is awesome, yeah. guys. And it goes out before it gets up to the ceiling. All right, y'all fire away. Y'all keep going. We've got about a minute left. So y'all well, keep. Watch it. It's going to go up. Yeah, see yeah. how it goes up, the lighter it gets. <laughs> it smells like burnt blue, too. Is that over? It's all right. It'll go up. Watch this. There it wow, goes. Wow, guys. All right. All right. Oh, we lost one on the floor. Okay, so I have a, a couple of questions for you guys. Last one. Um, what was our hypothesis at the beginning? That it would fly up. Yeah, exactly. And do you think that hypothesis was right? Yeah. I don't know. Well, for years it wasn't. <laughs> but hey, you can do this at home. Again, if you want us to come out to uh, your school and conduct a science experiment, you can email sciencewithsarah at ksat.com. Guys, what do y'all think? Awesome. Nice. Okay. Next time we're going to bring some marshmallows. Yeah, we'll bring some marshmallows. And All right, you wanted to be a star on TV, back, right? So thank you All guys right. so much. Here we go. Robert, real quick. So what did you think of this experiment? Uh, it was really fun. I like burning stuff. <laughs> yeah. I like turtles and uh, um, I don't know. <laughs> I guess I'm a TV awesome, star guys. now. You are a TV star now. <laughs> so tell awesome. everybody what your name is and what grade you, you're in and where you go to school. Uh, my name's Nettie. Uh, I'm, I go to Nimitz Middle School STEM and I'm in sixth grade. Perfect. Great job, guys. Good Give job, yourselves man. a hand. TV star. Good job. Back to you guys back in studio. <laughs> Yay. Thank you, guys. Great job to all the students out there. It was Lots a cool, of fun. Cool looking experiment. That did look like fun. Uh, good times. And uh, as we look outside, we can see that we've got clear skies and beautiful weather. Now, temperatures are warming up quickly from those morning lows. We were down near 60 this morning. Now we're making our way into the 70s and eventually 80s and maybe even 90s later this afternoon. Okay, let me show you the pollen count. Molds are high, 1,420. That number's down a little bit from yesterday. Ragweed has been kicking in. It's moderate at 150. Pigweed is low at 20. Weather, uh, you can see the... The clouds starting to move in there and the, the no clouds actually clear skies and that's what allowed those temperatures to really fall this morning. Here's the case at 12 hour forecast 89 degrees by 3 p.m. 90 by 4 p.m. 90 by 5 p.m. And then look for temperatures to uh, dip back down into the 80s and 70s by tonight. We do want to uh, take you out to Florida. This is a look at the live radar. You can see that eye wall getting a little bit closer, starting to see some pretty good storm surge already here on this side of the storm as it makes its way up towards, uh, again, the west coast of Florida, the Fort Myers area. Really is going to get hit hard by this storm. Winds are at 155 miles per hour. We know that's going to do some damage, and I think we've got an update, guys, coming up out of Florida. Thank you, Justin. Well, millions of Floridians are under evacuation orders as Hurricane Ian marches towards the Sunshine State's west coast. CNN's Ivan, CNN's Ivan Rodriguez is north of Fort Myers, close to where Ian is expected to make landfall later today. Hurricane Ian has now reached a speed of about 155 miles per hour. That's near becoming a Category 5 storm. We heard last night from Punta Gorda's uh, law enforcement saying emergency services will now be suspended. That includes things like the police department, fire department, and EMS. That same message echoed throughout other law enforcement agencies throughout the state of Florida. Advice now for residents is to hunker down and wait out the storm. Your time to evacuate is coming to an end.
An urgent warning from Florida's governor imploring residents to get to higher ground as Hurricane Ian barrels toward the state. Hey, uh, you're in a mandatory evacuation. More than 2.5 million people are under evacuation orders along the southwest coast, but officials are telling all Florida residents to brace for impact. There's also potential for flash flooding and river flooding uh, with 10 to 20 inches, uh, inches across central and northeast Florida. Ian caused a nationwide blackout after rolling through Cuba Tuesday, and thousands of utility workers are standing by across Florida to help deal with potential power outages. We also have uh, line workers and line men and line women coming from 27 other states. Uh, they're positioned at 24 different locations throughout the state. Rains from the outer bands of the hurricane are already whipping southern Florida, and at least two possible tornadoes caused damage Tuesday night. Schools, supermarkets, and theme parks across the state have announced closures as the window for people to board up and head out is coming to a close. We cannot send first responders into harm's way because you decided not to leave. We're learning that more than 100,000 people are now without power across Florida. One of the biggest concerns here where we are is both rain totals and storm surge. Rain totals could vary anywhere between six to eight inches. Storm surge levels now can be up to 16 feet. In Punta Gorda, I'm Ivan Rodriguez. 938, 72 degrees. And there's a live look out there at Florida. You can see the wind is pretty strong over there. They are uh, waiting for Ian to make landfall right now. We'll be right back. Much of the discussion right now is about Hurricane Ian, and you're looking live right now at uh, Fort Myers, Florida. High surf, already a lot of rain and wind in that area. And as we bring in Justin Horn, he was just telling us during the commercial break that you said it's, it's now getting relatively close to the Florida coastline. Yeah, by my estimations, it's only about 13 miles from the coastline. Now it's kind of moving parallel a little bit, but it is starting to make that turn and it's moving slow. But the, you're going to see more scenes like that today and probably worse. The storm mm -hmm. surge is going to be a huge, huge problem. Very strong winds and very heavy rain. We're going to get into Ian's forecast here in just a few, min few minutes. But first, we start with what we're seeing here. And we've got uh, clear skies. Boy, uh, again, it has just been a, a great start to the day. This stretch of weather is going to be really nice if you like cool mornings and warm afternoons. 69 right now. Northeasterly winds at about 6 miles per hour. Temperatures 65 in Kerrville after starting off in the 50s this morning. It's 70 in New Braunfels, 71 Uvalde, 62. Another cool spot there in Del Rio. And a lot of places here around San Antonio starting to make their way into the 70s. Dew points are low and that allows for those big swings in temperatures. So you start off cool and end up warm. And these dew points stay relatively unchanged through much of this week. As we look at the forecast highs today, 90 here in town, 91 in Gonzales. If you're in Canyon Lake, 88 degrees there, 86 out in Lakey. So uh, a fantastic, fantastic afternoon. But it's the mornings that have been so, so nice. And it stays that way. Uh, tomorrow morning, 59. Friday morning, 59. Saturday, 59. 60 on Sunday, 61 Monday. So we stay pretty consistent here with these cool mornings. And as we look at the big picture here, it's remarkably quiet across much of the country, of course, with the exception being Florida. And that is where Hurricane Ian is starting to close in on the coast. I mentioned it's only about 13 miles there away from some of those barrier islands near Fort Myers. And then there's tornado watch boxes for these outer bands that have produced some tornadoes. Winds are at 155 miles per hour. This makes it a strong category four, gusting to 190. Uh, it's moving north northeast at about 10 miles per hour. It's not terribly fast and it will start to make its way up to the coast a little bit later today, uh, probably making landfall again here within the next few hours. But this map shows the hurricane force winds that extend out a pretty good ways from the center. This is a large storm. So really anywhere from Tampa all the way down to Fort Myers, there is going to be hurricane force winds with gusts higher than that. And then this will move up into central parts of Florida by late tonight into early tomorrow, likely weakening, but not before bringing some heavy rain to places like Orlando and the east coast of Florida, Jacksonville, and then up towards Georgia and parts of the Carolinas by this weekend as it works its way north. Uh, storm surge, this could be one of the biggest issues. I mean, there's a lot of issues with this storm, but when you get 18 foot storm surge, 
that inundates much of the coast. So anyone living right along the coast, and there have been a ton of people evacuated, and rightfully so, there's going to be houses underwater. Uh, storm surge even up towards Tampa is three to six feet, but it grows as you get towards the Fort Myers area and uh, down towards Naples. Then there's the, the rain aspect. You're talking up to 15 inches of rain with this stretching from Tampa up towards the Orlando area. So that causes freshwater flooding. There's just a, a lot of components there that are not great for the state of Florida. And again, we'll have updates through the day today as Ian gets a little bit closer to landfall. Meantime, our seven day forecast, 91 Thursday, 89 Friday, 89 over the weekend, a little bit more cloud cover Sunday and Monday, but no big deal. We are basically status quo here going forward again with some of those cool mornings. Uh, basically each and every morning, guys. All right, thank you for the update on Ian and our local forecast, Justin. The high school volleyball playoffs are roughly one month away. Some area teams are beginning their second round of district play. No matchup was bigger last night than Clark versus Reagan. In cases, Andrew Seeley was at the match and has highlights for us. Well, the first time these two teams met back in August, Clark edged Reagan in a five set thriller to take the early lead in District 28 6A. On Tuesday night, the rematch lived up to the hype and then some as Clark again prevailed in another five set epic at Littleton Gym and now own a two game lead on the Rattlers in the district standings. We're just two really good teams. Um, I think keeping the intensity level up is always good. Um, it gives us like a little booster because we've already got them out the way. Now we just have the next um, challenges ahead of us and we just got to look for that. And these girls really hype each other up. We help each other. And I feel like we're really good at just like adjusting. And if we're not doing our greatest in the first set, we're able to just adjust and listen to what our coach is telling us to fix. The match was deadlocked at one set apiece with Clark leading Reagan 17-16 in the third set when the Cougars managed to win a rally that lasted 58 seconds. Junior Jalen Lott traveled nearly the entire court to help keep the ball off the floor, including an incredible diving dig. I just remember being exhausted. But um, yeah, I just remember being so proud of my team and uh, we hustled, we definitely hustled. That was definitely a good play. Meanwhile, Madison got back in the race for the playoffs with a sweep of Churchill. The Mavs improved to 5-4 and four in District 28-6A play, moving a little closer to Johnson, who sits at 5-3. and three. And in District 29-6A, Harlan took down Brennan in straight sets to earn their eighth straight win. The Hawks are 8-1, and one, just a game behind undefeated O'Connor. Harlan will get another crack at the Panthers Friday night at Northside Sports Gym at 5.30 p.m. For Good Morning San Antonio, I'm Andrew Seeley. 947, 73 degrees. And we have a traffic alert for you. This is happening on the north side. Uh, there's a major crash there has shut down Loop 1604 westbound near Bulverde Road. And as you can see, we don't have cameras in the area, but you can kind of see where that accident is happening right now. So again, the major crash has led up to the shutdown of Loop 1604 westbound. We'll be right back. October began Saturday and the month will bring horror, a new superhero and award season contenders to theaters. CNN's Rick Damagella gives us a preview of some of October's biggest movie titles. So two soldiers and the nurse found ourselves in Amsterdam. Margot Robbie, John David Washington, and Christian Bale lead an all-star cast in Amsterdam. Set during the 1930s, the mystery comedy from writer-director David O. Russell opens in theaters October 7th. I was certain that I saw him watching me. You pretend like you moved on, but you're actually just obsessed with death. October is high season for horror films, and one of the biggest horror movie franchises reaches a climax with Halloween Ends. Michael Myers simultaneously creeps into theaters and onto the Peacock streaming service October 14th. Black Adam, we're here to negotiate your peaceful surrender. I heard about at least three kids this afternoon. I'm not peaceful. Dwayne Johnson stars as the all-powerful anti-hero Black Adam. The blockbuster action flick also features the superheroics of Pierce Brosnan as Dr. Fate and Aldous Hodge as Hawkman. Black Adam soars into theaters October 21st. The lynching of my son has shown me that what happens to any of us anywhere in the world had better be the
the business of us all. Till stars Danielle Deadweiler as the mother of Emmett Till, the black teenager who was tortured and murdered in Mississippi in 1955. After screening in select theaters earlier in the month, Till opens nationwide October 28th. In Hollywood, I'm Rick Damagella. Can I at least just... And we're getting closer to the debut of Hocus Pocus 2, and the world premiere was last night in New York City. Bet Miller, Kathy Najimi, and Sarah Jessica Parker were all there, and they all talked about getting back together as the Sanderson sisters. It's like being in a time warp or going to a, being in a time machine to go back, you know, to get suddenly get dressed up in those same clothes from 30 years ago and suddenly behave like you did 30 years ago. It's just bizarre. And of course, we're 30 years older, so there are some things we actually we could do everything, but they were afraid to let us do everything. And some of it came back very quickly, and some of it I had to try to recall, work harder to remember because it's been a long time and. I I've only seen the movie once, so I had to watch it again before we started just so that I could remember even the pitch of my voice or well, how did I walk or how did I fall or, you know, um, but it was kind of amazing. Bette and I have been very good friends and we go to dinner and blah, 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 and I see Sarah at events and it's always lovely. So we're in each other's lives. We see each other and so it wasn't like the first time where we're sobbing and hugging or anything, but it was nice to get the sisters back together. And Hocus Pocus 2 debuts Friday on Disney+. Plus. Don't forget, there's still time to donate food to any participating Randolph Brooks Federal L Credit Union location. It's part of our KSAC Community Event for Hunger Action Month, which ends Friday. And if you scan that QR code on your screen, it will take you to our web article with a list of the 12 most wanted food items this month. Again, all this information online and the food drive ends on Friday. Hey, tomorrow on GMSA at 9, we're introducing you to seven-year-old Jarvis Henderson. He's going to be honored, the honored hero at the Light the Night Walk on October 8th. It's an event we are proud to sponsor because it is dedicated to curing blood cancers. Our Max Massey spoke with Jarvis and his mom about Jarvis's fight with leukemia and what comes next. Checking traffic right now, and we don't have a camera out there, but we can tell you right now that westbound 1604 is still closed in the Redland Road area, Bavardi Road area, due to an accident, and it is stacking right now. So again, this is kind of the far north side, leaning northeast, westbound 1604 closed near Redland Road. Justin. And today we're going to be up near 90 degrees. We're in the 70s right now, but some more cool mornings ahead. Great afternoons, a little more cloud cover by the latter part of the weekend and early next week. And very quickly, we'll show you a live radar of Hurricane Ian. Right now, just 11 miles or so from some of those barrier islands. If you're familiar with the west coast of Florida near uh, Fort Myers, the Sanibel area, really under the gun now. This, this is a powerful hurricane that is going to do, unfortunately, quite a bit of damage. And this is happening as we speak. We're talking probably within the next couple of hours for landfall, right? I believe so, yes. Okay, yes. all right. You're seeing a number of these shots now from locations throughout parts of western Florida. Yeah, very, very heavy wind out there. We'll have your updates online and, of course, at KSET News at Noon.